That was your two minutes. May I have your attention, please? Ah, what a great group. Welcome to the Tippy Lectures. For those of you who don't know why we call them the Tippy Lectures, they're named after Tippy McMichael, who was a member of this church for many years. And before she passed away of a series of illnesses, she bequeathed about a million dollars to this church. And it's been used all kinds of important ways. And very beneficent, beneficent people who follow her example have helped us out too. So if you have some extra money laying around, you know what to do with it. Uh, so this is, this is the, 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 in the series of Tippy McMichael Lectures. And Samantha Haycock, who is a member of the Becoming Beloved community and the coordinator, will introduce our speaker. And it's going to go from there. Thank you for coming. Good evening. It is my honor to introduce tonight's speaker. Our guest is a sought after teacher and workshop leader who brings four decades of experience working with people who have been marginalized because of economic status, race, gender, or physical ability as they pursue liberation, justice, and access to resources that can help lead them to health, wellness, and a more abundant life. She taught African American studies at Mercer University for 25 years and retired from Wesley, Wesleyan College as the Clara Carter Acri Distinguished Professor of Sociocultural Studies and founding executive director of the Lane Center for Community Engagement. She is the author of six books, including Living into God's Dream, Dismantling Racism in America which is available for purchase in the back of our room at the book table. Now as executive director of the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing in Atlanta, she continues to raise the consciousness of her students by sharing the insights she has gained from her pursuit of the truth. We are truly blessed to be in this room with her tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Katherine Meeks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to start with a, a little video clip called At the Purchaser's Option. It's Rihanna Giddens, who's a folk singer, and this is a piece from her new CD called Freedom's Highway. And it will set the per, uh, framework for what I'd like to talk about tonight. So. Screen. Thank you. 
can take my body, you can take my bones, you can take my blood, but not my soul. You can take my body, you can take my bones, you can take my blood, but not my soul. Turn the lights back. The whole CD is called uh, Freedom, Freedom, Freedom's Highway, in case you're interested in hearing the rest of her music. I think she's absolutely fabulous. So I grew up uh, in Arkansas. It's fun to be back home, in a way. Uh, <laughs> I left here, I left the state, I was born in El Dorado, Arkansas, and went to college, uh, high school, graduated from high school in Brinkley, Arkansas, which is uh, the northeastern part of the state, and Memphis used to be the big city that we would go to, and particularly to the Overton Park Zoo. I remember all of those things. When I left in 1964, after graduating from high school, I said I was never gonna live in the South again, and then I moved to Georgia. So I've lived in Georgia for the last 48 years, and it was the place where I needed to be after going to college in California, graduating from Pepperdine University in Los Angeles, California. Being in Georgia was the place for me to be, to work on the things that I needed to work on in terms of my own liberation and to be able to share with other people things about the possibilities for liberation. And so it is good to be here with you tonight, and thank you so much for your enthusiastic welcome and amazing hospitality that I have experienced in just the three short hours since I got on the premises. So you, I don't know how you see yourselves, but I, as an outsider, can say that the hospitality is exquisite. Thank you. So I want to talk about the, the title that uh, someone asked me to say what my titles were going to be for these talks, and I gave them some titles about uh, seeking racial healing in the 21st century for tonight. And what I want to do tonight is talk some about the external community in the journey towards healing. Tomorrow morning, I want to talk about the internal journey that focuses, that has to be focused if we are serious about healing. Now you will notice in my talks that I don't talk about racial reconciliation because I don't believe in it. I don't believe it's possible to be reconciled to people that you've never had a relationship with. I think relationship, reconciliation implies there was a relationship that got broken that needs to be restored 
And in the United States of America, the relationship between black people and white people was a transactional arrangement, was not a coming together of equal parties with respect for one another. That was not, that did not happen. And still, it's, we struggle for it to happen even in the 21st century. So it's really important for us to tell the truth on the journey toward racial healing. It's very important to name the things that need to be named and to talk about them rather than to try to kind of act like they don't exist. We spend a lot of time in this country talking about civil rights and racial reconciliation and all of that, and we see where we are in 2019. And so where we are in 2019 says to me that we didn't ask the right questions and we didn't do the work we needed to do or we would be in a different place. So it's quite frankly, I think, that when you realize that you didn't ask the right questions because you're not getting the results that you were hoping for, then what you need to do is to be willing to try to find out what the questions are and to try to see how, do, how can you get where you're trying uh, to go. I, I'm not convinced that the whole United States is interested in racial healing. I'm not convinced of that. But I am convinced that God's people have to be interested in it because it has everything to do with us being who we say we are and who we want to be. And if we're going to try to accomplish that goal of being well racially, then there's some things that we have got to pay attention to. And I start with this clip because this clip really sums up the dilemma. The dilemma that we, the ways in which we started this country constructed upon an indefensible principle of white supremacy. That white skin is supreme to other, every other kind of skin, especially black skin and red skin of native indigenous people. That was the premise upon which we built this country. It was a myth, it was a myth, it was not true because nobody is superior to anybody else because God made everybody. And if you think that there's some people who are more, who are more superior human than somebody else, then you have to ask yourself, do you think that there are many gods? Because there's either one God who made everybody and what kind of God would make some folks better than others? And they're all the creation of that God. How, why would you split yourself up like that? That would be a strange God to do that. And God is the author of wholeness and completeness. So it doesn't make sense to think that there's some, one part of God making this group of brown people, this group of black people, this group of white people, and this group of red people, and they're all somehow a little bit less important than each other. That doesn't make sense to me. So if you come to the conclusion that there is one God who's made everybody in God's image and equal, then that's a good starting place because then we start with everybody here is equal, everybody here, everybody is loved by God equally. And whenever I talk about this, I have to hasten to say that I really don't like knowing that because there's some folks that I don't want God to love. You know, and you've got some folks you would rather God didn't love them too much too, if you tell the truth. We all have our list of people we could put on a spaceship and send off somewhere, but we know that if we do, we gotta go back and get them because ultimately God requires us to befriend those folks that we wanna send off on spaceships. So, so I think it's, it's important for us to tell that piece of truth to ourselves that everybody's made in God's image. And we live in a country that constructed itself upon the premise that some people were better than others. That people with white skin were superior to people with black skin. It was part of the way the, the people who were doing the, the constructing allowed themselves to defend an indefensible system, the indefensible system of slavery. 
It is an indefensible thing to think that you have the right to enslave another human being. And so if we want to be serious about the journey toward healing, we, we do have to talk about that. And it's the thing that nobody wants to talk about. People want to say, well, it's the 21st century, and we elected a black president in this country, and you can go do what you want to do, and everything's OK. When the real truth is, slavery has yet to end. It has simply evolved. And it has new iterations. And so it's important to understand that until it's, the, it's gone in its entirety, until there is equity, until there are systems that are not poised in terms of pitting somebody over here against somebody over here and making somebody more important than somebody else, until we have a country where we're not doing that, we cannot rest. God's people cannot rest until justice is the way we operate. Now, I understand that nobody in here is 200 years old or 300, so you, didn't, you weren't around when they were writing all this, these documents and coming up with these ideas. I get that. But you live in a country that's predicated upon the premise that your white skin makes you better than my black skin makes me. Right now, right this minute, in the United States of America, and you all have been doing some work in this church, so I'm sure this isn't news to you. But what the news is, is what do we do with that fact? Do we just go home and, and sit in the corner and, and be disturbed and distressed and immobilized because it's such a big to-do, and what are you gonna do about it? You can't quit being white. You know, I mean, you can't. I have, John Howard Griffin tried it, but it didn't work too well for him. So, so I wouldn't suggest that you try it. So you can't quit being white, and you can't make the history be different. The history is, and I, your history is, my history is, who we are, what we are, where we've come from, who our parents are, what, what that external world is that we were raised in, is, and there's nothing you can do about that in terms of making it a different thing. Now, what we do have the capacity to do is to decide who, who we want to be in light of those facts. Who do I want to be? How do I want to live? What do I want to hold on to? So I think that white people have to come to grips with this business of white supremacy. And don't think about, I'm talking about folks running around in, in sheets and uh, neo-Nazis when I talk about supremacy. I'm not talking about that. Those are extremes, and no, nobody in this room would be in that extreme. I'm pretty sure of that. Or you probably just wouldn't be here if you were that extreme. But the notion of something being above the way I'm talking about supremacy is something that is supreme, something that is more important, that is above, that is the essence of what life is. That's the basic myth of white skin. White skin makes you better than. That's the, that's the, that, was the, that was the motto. That was the, the driving energy that helped to create oppression all over the world but we'll just stick with it here because it's too big to think about. It's big enough to think about it in America. It's way too big to try to think about it all over the world. However, I have worked with people in Honduras on racial healing, and the stories are so similar to the stories here. So what I have come to understand is that oppression is a system, a, a system of energy that Wherever it exists, it's the same system. It's rooted in the understanding that somebody is more important than somebody else. And because you're not as important as I am, whatever I choose to do to you is OK. That, that is the kind of foundation out of which oppression grows. So when we think about trying to get on this pathway to healing, 
we don't get to leave the history behind. So this story of, of the, the purchaser's option, you can take my baby, you can take my bones, you can take my blood, but you can't have my soul. You know, that, that was the dilemma. That was the dilemma of people who were slaves because they, 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 didn't, they didn't belong to themselves. Being a slave means you don't belong to yourself. You belong to somebody else. But your soul belongs to you. And you have something to say about whether or not your soul goes just because your body and your bones and your blood have gone. So that's why I started with this song, because it's important to know that the journey toward healness starts at the beginning. Starts at the beginning. We can't jump to, oh, let's go do a project somewhere, or let's go become collaborative with a, a church of people of color. That's not where you can start. You have to start with the first things, the first things first. And the first thing is to get really deeply connected to the truth of what we have created here and get deeply connected to how hard it is to extricate yourself from that reality when you have lived it as a fish has lived in water. It is no way, it, you, it's, one of my friends said, if you ask a fish what water is, it can't tell you. The shortest conversations that I have ever had with white people is when I ask them to talk about what is whiteness and what has racism done to harm them? Those two questions. Because you don't have to think about it unless you choose to. And basically, the way the world is, the country is constructed is perceived as being reality. It's the way it is. That is so much what Southerners said about slavery, about a lot of the, about lynching, about a lot of the things that happened historically, well, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. And to say that's just the way it is, is to just make an excuse to not struggle with whether or not the way it is, is the way it ought to be. So the history is really critical. Uh, before the last two or three years, I used to have white people telling me a lot that they thought our biggest problem was we talked about race too much. And, I, you know, and that our talking about it was making a problem. So, you know, I'm, I'm Miss Dismantling Racism workshop leader, and you're telling me that I'm the problem. It's real interesting, given the history. But I don't hear that so much anymore because now people are, at least people who are trying to be progressive and honest, are really having to look at the way things are and really assess how things are in the country and to pay attention to the fact that they really aren't any different from the way they've always been. We just managed to cover it up better. And people, progressive good people, white people, were able to not have to deal with it because it wasn't so in your face. And now it's like you, gotta, you just can't quite pull that off. <laughs> you have to do something because it's just it's just too standing there like, you know, the elephant's not only in the room, the elephant's walking around stomping its feet. And so maybe you could ignore it as long as it would stay in the corner, but it's not in the corner anymore. And so we have to pay attention. And quite frankly, I find that to be a source of encouragement because I know that nobody, including me and all the folks I've ever encountered, nobody really makes a deep, transformational journeys unless we have to. You know, we don't want to change. We want things to be different, but we hope we don't have to change. <laughs> Just somehow or another, can we get the difference here, but don't ask me to be different, because that's just too far to go. But the real truth is, we can't get to the change unless we're willing, as Gandhi said, to be the change we want to see. 
And, and I know, I've been talking to Jim and others here, and I know you all have come to Atlanta and you have a group of people here working. So I know you care about this. And I want to, I'm wanting to say that caring is about being willing to put yourself in places where you are incredibly vulnerable, being willing to question the very nature of the reality that you have been taught is, is the thing. To be willing to, to, to question the systems that we have constructed in this country and to realize how much they're predicated upon ideas of imbalance and inequity. And not to be ready to defend indefensible systems of injustice. Because, um, because we've been swimming in the sea of racism and calling it reality, it is difficult to name acts of aggression and racism when they happen. Because if you start naming it, it's like, have, you know when you have something that's unraveling and you pull on a thread and it just keeps on unraveling and if you don't stop and put a little knot in it, it'll just unravel till the whole seam is, is loose. That's how this stuff is. When you start asking the questions, when you start interrogating yourselves and interrogating the history and looking at the ways in which things are being done, it's like pulling the string. And you can't, it's difficult to go put this, <laughs> I sew a little bit, so I know that like you gotta get a needle and re-thread the, the unwrap, the thread you're raveling and try to, try to fix the seam, it's difficult to do that. It's almost easier just to take the whole thing loose and re-sew it. And that is actually what we've got to do in this country. We have got to take the whole thing loose and reconfigure it on the, pre on the premise that God made everybody and everybody's equal and everybody deserves to have a chance to live their lives to the fullness that God has intended for them to live. That does not mean everybody has to be rich. It does not mean everybody has to act white. It does not mean everybody has to act black or brown. It means that we have to have create spaces where people can be who God put them on the earth to be. And we don't need to be trying to tell them what that is. They can figure that out. But the spaces for liberation need to be there. And one of the major jobs of the church is to help us liberate our hearts. To liberate our hearts and make space for other people's hearts to be liberated. And we can do that because we have made up our minds to be on this journey that leads us to healing. And um, the other thing that I want to say while I'm passing by here is that black people, the descendants of the slaves, have to work on internalized depression because we have bought the narratives. We bought the white narrative, the slave master's narrative about ourselves in some deep psychological ways. And we don't like to talk about it and we don't want to own it, but we do have to deal with how we see ourselves and how we project that way that we see ourselves onto one another. We also have to deal with how we can be complicit with the systems of oppression because we have internalized this notion of who we are, which isn't really who we are. So in order for healing to happen, white people have to decide they want to be well, and that's more important than being white and right. Black people have to decide they want to be well, and that's more important than being the victim. Because we have gotten into, you know, look at what happened to us, and we do need to pay attention to that. But we also need to say that right alongside that is a capacity to be something else. That God gave us some capacities that we have to search around for and, and be open to finding. And I'm, I'm really thinking that the slaves caught some glimpses of this truth 
that we in the modern age, we black folks in the modern age, have lost. The slaves had some connection to resiliency and the capacity to survive that I'm thinking that we need to re reconnect to as black people. And I'm working on that. I'm working on that for myself, looking at the spirituals and just trying to understand what was it that made those people able, the slaves able, to, to, to live and have hope and, and to, make, to leave this legacy that they left for me and, and all of us, uh, the legacy of the spirituals where you can find so much about resilience in them. And I think it's important to explore that. So there's some important work that has to be done out in the world. We have to look at the systems, we have to look at the constructions, we have to look at the ways that racism is manifesting itself, and we have to decide if we're gonna be a resistor or if we're gonna be in complicity with it. Those are the choices. You're either resisting or you're cooperating. It's it, there's nothing in between. Though sometimes we get to thinking that there's something in between. I'm not, I'm not cooperating because this, that, or the other. If you are trying to mediate oppression and somehow make oppression defensible, you are complicit with it. You know, if you don't stand against, if you don't stand fully and faithfully against oppression, you're standing for it, with it. So there is the, the call to be a resistor out there in the world. But to be a resistor requires some deep inner work, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Because what typically happens is we get caught up in the resisting. We know how to be, we know how to march. We know how to protest. We know how to be activistic, so, at least some of us. But we don't know much about how that's all connected to our insides. We, we, we lost track of that. And it's kind of a, a sad thing to me because I think that God's people are supposed to be together. I mean, when I say together, whole, that we're supposed to be able to go out and do this out of work and have this inner journey so that there's a well person doing the work. And so then the work, the results is different from when you're doing the work and you're all splintered and half crazy yourself. And, and a lot of the work that we have done in this country has been done by people who are half crazy themselves. Because we didn't bother to talk about how do you take care of yourself? How do you keep yourself from being used up and done in? And when you get done, you don't know what you've done. Someone said to me yesterday, they think that the, the biggest job we have is really trying to save ourselves. That's our biggest job. Because, because she went on to say, because I, I know that I'm a piece of work. And most of us could say that, I think. And Howard Thurman, my, my mentor and person that I love to talk about everywhere I go, says our job, our work we're doing is trying to get ourselves out of prison. We're trying to liberate our own hearts. And in the process of that work, we help others to be liberated. Because uh, Henry Nouwen also has a, a very lovely um, image about that, and it's that, that we're wounded healers. You know, we're all wounded. Everybody. Everybody in this room, everybody on this planet, everybody in the Episcopal Church or any other church, we're all wounded. But we have caught glimpses of the bandage closets and we found some bandages for some of our wounds and we're continuing to explore the possibility of more bandages and in the process of living and working together in community, we share where the bandage closets are. Don't you just love that? It just gets us all off of our high horses and we can stop being, I've got it together because I know this and I'm, you know, I'm Miss Progressive or I'm Mr generous or whatever, because we know that we all have wounds and we're just all trying to make it, all trying to get to where God wants us to be. So um, externally, slavery 
has never ended. It just evolved, says Brian Stevenson, the director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery. Some of you've been to the Equal Justice Initiative Museum. And if you look at um, the way in which you have to deal with this work externally, you have to pay attention, first of all, to slavery, and then you have to pay attention to lynching, because lynching followed slavery, because lynching was a way to reinforce the notion that slavery was what the black folks really deserved. So lynching followed slavery, and then we, then we have now um, emerged into having the prison industrial complex, which, which is another way to say, this is where you belong. We are willing to spend more money figuring out how to put black and brown people in prison than we are in how to educate them. You know, we will make up our minds about how many people we need, how many beds we need to have in prison. We will project all of those things and then we make sure we fill up those beds because that's what, that's what happens when you make those projections. And the prison industrial complex is actually a strategic plan for the maintaining of the supremacy notion. It's a strategic plan, it's not an accident. Go watch the movie 13th, the thir based on the 13th Amendment, and that whole little clause in the 13th Amendment about being able to lock up black folks after, sla after liberation, I mean after emancipation, not liberation, but after emancipation, to lock them up if, they, if you were caught standing on the sidewalk if you were caught walking from one field to the other, you could be arrested for not working. So if you were a slave, where, what were you supposed to be doing? You're now ex-slave, and you're out trying to get from one place to another. There's some great films that I would recommend to you. One is called Slavery by Another Name, which is a documentary. It's also a book, but the documentary is shorter and probably more fun to <laughs> engage. Um, that looks at the penal system, the, the penage system, where we lock, took, had convict leasing and all that stuff you may have heard of. But then it emerged, it kept on, it kept on morphing, and it emerged into this big, massive prison industrial complex that we've got now. So slavery, lynching, mass incarceration, the death penalty, and 21st century police killings, all, all connected. And if you want to work on racial healing, this is an external set of constructs that cannot be bypassed. Because when you try to take one and work on it, you miss the point because they are connected and there's no way to, to, to delineate them because when you try to do that, then you, it's like trying to put a Band-Aid on a cancer. So it's important to pay attention to the same energy that makes it possible for a policeman to kill a 13-year-old black boy before he ever even talks to him in the playground, on the playground, in a park, is the same kind of spirit that made it possible to drag a black man out of his house and lynch him because he said, hello to a white woman or didn't get off the sidewalk or whatever because lynchings were done for the most outrageous reasons. And all of it has an element of terrorism. You keep terrorizing the, the populace. You keep, and if you can keep people terrorized, you can keep them controlled. And then you keep them in their place. I found it so interesting when Barack Obama was running for president, for people to say he didn't know his place. I found that to be incredibly interesting that that language would surface. He doesn't know his place. Where should his place be? Mr. Harvard Law Review, <laughs> Senator, where should your place be? You know? But that was said, and it was said more than once that he didn't know his place. And even now, I find it just striking that, that the, the, the lynching, the ropes are showing up 
in different places. You know, you've been keeping up with this in the news. So you have to ask yourself, what is that about? And it is, it is connected to this notion of these people have a place and they've gotten out of it. And somebody needs to help them reconnect to what their place is. That's part, I mean, it's, um, there's a lot of work being done right now about DNA, kind of the, the, the trauma, the kind of the, uh, the connection between trauma in terms of DNA movement. So that traumas from slavery might be showing up in the generation now or 20 years from now. The same thing with Holocaust survivors, when people have experienced extreme trauma that it gets passed down generationally. Now, my son is a scientist and not me, so I don't know scientifically how to explain all that, but I remember the Bible talking about the sins of the fathers visiting the sins of the, the, upon their children. And for me, it makes sense that maybe one of the ways that happens is that there's some kind of, kind of internal memory at the cellular level that impacts the next generations. I don't know how that works, but what I do know is that we need to not brush it off. That there's some truth to understanding that the history is not just forgotten because you're trying to forget it. It doesn't go away. It follows you. And just like in, your, in our own personal lives, you know, some stuff happens when we're in high school or college and we get to be 30 or 40 and we try to act like it didn't happen, but it keeps on revisiting us. Because it's, that kind of stuff has to be embraced and dealt with and not denied. And so as a nation, we can't do what we've done to black people and native indigenous people and now to brown people and then just go on as if we didn't do anything. It just doesn't work. So these intersections have got to be noticed and we have to pay attention to the historical records and we have to embrace them and we don't get to say, well, I didn't have anything to do with it. How many times have I heard that? I didn't have anything to do with it. Or I don't really, you know, I, I'm not prejudiced, white folks will say to me, you don't have to prove to me you're not prejudiced. You just have to live your life like a liberated person. And if you live your life like a liberated person, you will want everybody to be liberated. And that will be proof enough. It's not necessary to try to talk about it. You don't, I don't need to talk about whether I'm liberated. I need to live as if I'm liberated. And if I am liberated, somebody will be able to figure that out. If I'm talking about it too much, it's probably because I'm trying to convince myself, I think. So I think that the, that the stuff that I'm convinced about, I don't have the need to convince anybody else. I really don't. It's when I get into big arguments, it's because I'm not quite sure. And then I'm ready to fight because I'm not quite sure myself and, and I can't let you make me have this doubt and I gotta defend it. And if I stop and tell myself, maybe, you know, maybe you don't quite believe what you thought you did. Does that make sense? That the stuff you find you're the most defensive about is the stuff you're the least sure about. And the stuff that you're really sure about, you can state it and go on. You know, you can, you can take it or leave it. So I think that we, white, black, brown people, native indigenous people, and native indigenous people have got to figure out how to live on this planet together with peacefulness and respect and equity and absolute real relationships and not just to be doing transactions with each other. I think, I think that um, if we don't figure it out, we're gonna do, a, all of us are gonna do ourselves in. I think, that the, I think that, the, that the universe demands that we work on this. 
I, I really do believe that. And I, and I don't mean like next week, I think the earth's gonna blow up. That's not what I'm talking about. I just think that we're gonna keep on being sick as a nation until we get it, until we do better. And so I wanna stop here. I'm not stopping probably soon enough because this was billed from seven until eight. But if you have questions, that you want to ask or comments, short comments you want to make, I'll be happy to, to do that as long as you're willing to be here, unless you're willing to be here all night. I'm not willing to do that. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now remember, all of what I just said is about the outer community. And tomorrow we're gonna to talk about the inner community. And I hope you show up for that because you do need to hear both pieces. Thank you, Dr. Minks. Yeah. Questions or, or short comments? And the microphone will come. And if you'll stand up, thank you. Um, I don't know exactly when it was, if it was as we were, Seeing, seeing Obama leave office, or it, it was right around in there, I think. Um, I watch quite a bit of television, and I noticed that all of a sudden, all the advertisements had a black person and a white person married to each other in a home, and, mm -hmm. and every single advertisement had the same. Every single one of them had the black person and the white person married to each other. It was like overnight, and I have wondered and wondered, what are, are they are they wishing for us that we can get along? Is it just Hollywood? Uh, is that is that what the rest of the world looks like in Fayetteville? Is not looking like that, or I'm I'm just mystified by mm -hmm. by what television projects mm -hmm. out there for us to see. Mm -hmm. I, I, do you have a question? I, I guess I kind of would like to know what you think well, that's about. Just sociologically speaking, yeah. what is that that's influencing us by, by television? Advertisers are, the advertising world is incredibly slick. So there's some angle that for them, it's got nothing to do with trying to heal the nation. That I can be certain of. I don't, I don't know exactly what it's about, but I know they're not interested in healing the nation. It, it so. sells more stuff. Right, so. Thank you. Up, up front. Right here. I didn't actually join the book club that did this, but one of the books that uh, speaks somewhat to what you're talking about is The Cross and the Lynching Tree by Dr. Right. Cohn. It's, it's awful. <laughs> I mean, I can say that, but, but it's a really good book to read if you weren't a part of the book group. I have a question. One of the things I'm aware of now that's going on is that we are, being, we are really being taught to be fearful. And when I examine the kind of prejudice that I've been taught, it was around fear. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but it is about being fearful. Right. Well, in order to... Um control people, you have to, you have to um, make them into monsters. And then whatever you do to them to control them works, which was what happened with the slaves. And then you, you, um, you have to prevent white people from thinking, you, ha you have to sell this notion to the whole community. And so the best way to do that is to create fear toward that group of people. One of, my, one of my colleagues told me that she was dumbfounded by remembering that her grandfather, she's white, her grandfather told her as a little girl she could never go outside to play when the black workman was there. And she didn't, she, she didn't know, and it took her till now to, to put that all together as what he was doing, creating this fear in her from this man who only came to work and who was never anything but nice as far as she could tell. So it's a control mechanism. You get people to fear, you can make them do what you want them to do. You, and you've, 
black folks were being made to be afraid and white folks were supposed to be afraid. And, and honestly, to, you know, this is not to disparage the white men in the room, but white men were saying, you gotta be afraid of these black men because they're rapists, but they were actually the rapists. So that's a, I mean, that was the strange thing that was happening. It's like you're, and we'll talk about this some more tomorrow when we talk about projection, but the very thing you're doing, you're saying somebody else is, that's who somebody else is. And it, it just creates a whole, you see, it's a, it becomes a systematized fearfulness. You know, fear becomes a commodity. It, it did then and it is, still is. It's a commodity. And it's a commodity of control. Thank you. Other questions? I'm from Mariana. Are you? Oh, okay. In February 1972, I was standing at the front door as my parents were entering when someone blew a hole through the front door with a 30-06. My father was president of the public school board, and the schools were being integrated. Ooh. And the young black men were furious it had taken so long, rightfully so, and the white rednecks were furious that the schools were being integrated. Mm -hmm. Then white flight happened. Mm -hmm. This afternoon I was having lunch with friends from Mariana and I was saying, what could we have done differently so this could have worked? I'd love your mm -hmm. thoughts on that because I'm sure you've seen the white flight happen yeah. all over the South. And I yeah. understand why you don't want to come back to the South. Well, but I live in Georgia, <laughs> so. Uh, so you should never say what you won't do because God's got other plans for you. Um, well, you know, the thing of it is, we did the same thing with school desegregation that we did with everything else. It was, it was made to happen because of the laws and the people went most of the time kicking and screaming and projecting all these negative things. I think if we just put the kids in the schools and the grown folks had stayed out of it, they probably might have figured out how to do all right, actually. You know, it, and if they'd stayed out of it by not telling the kids at home that they weren't supposed to be with these black kids or, or vice versa. So uh, adults have a whole bunch of things to atone for because we've, we, have, we teach the kids, kids don't come into the world deciding that somebody's not as good as somebody else, that prejudice is learned and taught. And so I think that was, we didn't want that to happen. We didn't want the schools to be integrated and so we did it, we made it into what, what it turned out to be violent and horrible and white people running because having to live with black folks was the worst thing that could happen to you notion. And I think that's, that's very sad. I also think that black people lost something with the integration of schools that, that I'm not sure that what we gained is equal to what we lost, lost because we, when we were, my mother, when my mother was in school, she was taught Latin, she was taught how to recite black poetry. She was, they did uh, what they call recitations and they did orations and all those things. And then when the schools got integrated, black teachers and the ways in which they did things was not good enough and so all that went away. And then we have a group of black children who don't know how to do those things. And for me, that's a great detriment. Even though I think it was important for the laws to change, I, I don't think we should have had to have separate schools. I think that the schools should have been integrated and the black teachers, what the black teachers had to bring and the white teachers should have also been brought to the school. But there was no respect for the culture of black people or the ways in which black people did anything. So, so it was a great loss. It's a great loss to black kids and it's a great loss to white people because they should have been able, you know, just while you're learning about Plato, you should also be learning about the black folks that were making contributions and doing good stuff. So we cheated ourselves a lot. And now we've got a huge mess because schools are still quite polarized and, and education is pretty pitiful in many places, particularly for black and poor kids. So, and if we don't do something about it, 
we got to do something about it other than continuing to build prisons, because that seems to be our remedy. For poor education, just build prisons, which is a dumb way to be running a, a, a culture, I think. Thank you. In the back. Uh, speaking of schools, I'm a teacher and a coach at uh, Springdale High School up the road, and um, it is a fantastic school. Um, very culturally diverse. I think probably the, the most poverty-stricken in the area, but we have a terrible, <clears throat> leave it to the kids, they're awesome. You come into our school, you would think it's the best place ever. But I have a question for you in the fact that we have a perception committee, which is kind of sad to me. We had to create a perception committee because our school is perceived as the brown school, the poor school. Um, and if you step into our school, it's magnificent. Um, what would you say to the teachers in our school of how do we change that perception so that people don't have to step into our school to see how amazing our kids really are? What can we do other than we try to tell our story? And we try to get our story out on social media about all the wonderful things our Hispanic and our Marshallese and our African-American students are doing. What else can we do? Probably not much. <laughs> because people, first of all, are going to believe what they want to. And unless folks are willing to come and, and see the school or willing to hear the truth and believe it, a lot, when people are telling the truth about what black and brown people are doing, typically white people don't believe it. So that's one important thing to do. When somebody black or brown is telling their story, believe it and don't try to edit it. So that's some of what you're running up against. You, you're telling your story, but there are folks out there saying, well, that can't be so because they have a set of prejudices that won't allow them to hear that truth. So the other thing I would say is to just keep doing what you're doing and be really good at it and just forget of what folks think. I mean, that's, that's the most, that is the most um, successful way to live in a world where you know what you're doing is good and other people don't get it, then that's their problem. And you just keep doing it as long as, and do it better, you know, and just keep doing it better and, I, and, and not worry. And I don't know, I don't know about having a perception committee. I mean, that feels like, that feels like you are trying to fix a problem that's not your problem. And I'm sure you didn't form the committee, but, but whoever formed it, it seems like trying to fix a problem that's not your problem and that you shouldn't let your, you should be careful about letting yourself try to fix other people's junk because it takes up a whole lot of energy and, and you never can do it, no matter how many committees you have. The perception that folks want to have is the one they'll have. Same, same is true for individuals too. You just have to do what you have to do. You know, when people, when people say, you know, somebody's playing the race card or you're always talking about race, well, that's, let, if you want to use up your energy talking like that, go ahead, because I'm going to keep doing what I do. You know, so, and, and that's, that's what a lot of my white friends worry about, that they'll get labeled as playing the race card or being always on the, the one defending or talking about racial equity. Well, if that's what you believe, then you, you, it's, it's, if people want to see you that way, that's fine. Because they'll see you however they choose to see you anyway, no matter what you say. Right? I mean, how, how many times have you discovered that? You try hard to be something and then folks don't get it at all. Half the time we don't know who we are, let alone who other people are. So. <laughs> Up front, Charlie. I assume you believe deep down that this country can achieve racial healing. My question to you is, what gives you that hope that we can get there? Well, um, I think a lot of it's my faith. I believe God can do anything. And, and also believe that whether people know it or not, that deep down inside of everybody is some understanding that nobody deserves to be a slave. Whether, regardless of how you've acted, even if you had slaves, there was something in you that knew you shouldn't have slaves, but you overrode it for, for whatever reasons. 
And so I think that the, I think that force, that God and the force of good and right are stronger than darkness and evil. And that gives me hope. Now, I, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. I'm not naive enough to believe that. Also think it's really important for us to imagine this country as a country where racial healing is happening. I mean, we need to, we need to imagine ourselves that way because that will help energize the work if we can begin to believe that more, that we, we can, in fact, do something to fix the mess that's been made. It's a big mess, and you can't think about it in terms of the big mess. You just got to get up every day and go do your part and be faithful to doing your part. Like you think you're fixing it all, but you know good and well, you got your little teaspoon sitting down by the ocean, you know, <laughs> and, you, and the goal is to, to get some dry land. And so you think, what a fool I am with my little teaspoon, but this is what I'm called to do, and I'm gonna sit here and faithfully dip with my little teaspoon. If people do that all over the place, just think what'll happen. So that's, that's what gives me hope. Time I'll tell you one other quick little story. Sojourner Truth, and then we'll get to you, so we won't forget you. Sojourner Truth was in the back of a building, and Frederick Douglass was speaking about how bad everything was. And Sojourner Truth stood up and pointed her finger at him and said, Frederick, is God dead? <laughs> if God's not dead, things can't be as bad as you think they are. So, so I, 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 I want to channel Sojourner Truth's faith, too, around that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. One or, one or two more, right there in the back. Thank you. I was very interested when you mentioned Hon your time in Honduras, yeah. um, because my awakening about the legacy of slavery really came when I lived outside the U.S. for some mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And I've also spent some time in Honduras. So um, just wondered what your thoughts were about sort of the connections um, that you saw with slavery and racism in Honduras, but also maybe some of the differences and how yeah. you saw the U.S. from that perspective, that time. Well, what I, I think what became more clear for me than anything was the, the, the universality of oppressive energy, that wherever you encounter oppression, it's the same thing. You know, we think if, if, um, if when we start talking about race, we can't talk about, we, what we say about race doesn't have anything to do with gender oppression or oppression toward people that are disabled or whatever. But it, oppression is an energy system and it's universalized all over the earth. So wherever it is, it's the same system, it's the same energy. And that, got, that was really clear to me, that was really made clear to me in Honduras as I listened to um, native indigenous people and people of Spanish descent talking about how they felt about each other. And, and some of them, they all looked alike to me. You know, They all speak Spanish, they all look alike, and yet they've got these these things that they've de designated to make one group better than the other. And I started realizing, I, I didn't start just realizing it, I saw more clearly the insidiousness of oppression energy. That it's, you know, does that make sense? Because I, I don't want to say stuff that doesn't make sense to people. But if you think about oppression, not as, an in, not, um, not as a, a sociological, psychological thing, but a spiritual thing, in terms of energy, if you think about it as as a, as a force, like you know that that's hard to to put on the wall somewhere, and think about that being all over the world, the the, the thing that's creating uh, the bad stuff that's happening in places where people are being oppressed. So, so there is no difference really. In one way, it, it's all the same kind of denigrating energy. The only differences are the cultural pieces, like whether it's black and white or native indigenous people in this country, or if it's uh, native indigenous people in Honduras or people of African descent or people of Spanish descent, you know, there. So I don't know if that helps, but. Thank you. Yeah. One more. Noah.
So that last question reminded me of something I've been thinking about, which is, um, you know, have you encountered any um, communities in which you felt like this endeavor had been successful and there wasn't necessarily that impressive energy? Um, no. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't, but I've not lived in a lot of places. I've, I lived in the United States all my life. I've traveled a little bit to other places, but um, I think what, what I have encountered is there are groups of people trying to be conscious and trying to work on this and trying to be, uh, become beloved community. There are folks try, trying to do that, but in terms of, in, in a global sense, no. Because, because oppressed people learn to be oppressors. And so when you get to be empowered, then you act like the oppressor. You know, everybody was so excited that we elected all these women to the House of Representatives. I'm not gonna be excited until I see them redefine power. Because otherwise they're just gonna act like white men. Because black men act like white men and then, and then be, because that's what we know, that's, that is the model. And so then when you get to be powerful, you act like what you've, been, what you've learned. So we just elected three black women bishops, and we had one already, Bishop Jennifer. So I'm inviting them to Atlanta to engage in a conversation that asks the question, how is being a black woman bishop going to be different from being a white man bishop? I'm serious, I'm very serious. Because until we redefine power, we will just keep on replicating it. We'll dress it up a little. I mean, you know, white male power with a skirt on is still white male power, <laughs> right? White male power in a black body is still white male power. And we have not learned how to, to define the, the difference. And I'm not saying that I even know the difference. What I'm saying is we need to be engaged in asking the question to try to see how can we do something different here that, that, that uses our power in ways to build community rather than to set up hierarchies. But you've got to have courage to do it. And, and most folks don't have the courage. So that's why it's hard to see, you know, somebody gets elected and you think they're gonna be something so much, that's gonna be so wonderful, but then they just act like the last person. Black folks were so disillusioned with, Bish with Barack Obama. They never stopped to think about that you don't get to be elected president in this country if your agenda is black folks. I mean, good grief. Where did they think they were? You had to be a player in the system to get that far, so your power was gonna be modulated by the, by the norm. And if you didn't realize that, it was just that you weren't connected to reality, which a lot of folks weren't, and they were so upset. And I just would say, well, what did you expect? You know, and then would women get elected? The same thing. So, so if the women in Congress can show me any evidence of re defining power for themselves, then I'm gonna be real excited. But I didn't get there yet because I haven't seen it yet, because I'm afraid this is going to be too much of, you got to do what the men do, because ultimately that's the system, and that system is the one that's going to end up judging you in some kind of way. God is asking us all to pay attention to why we were put on the earth. Individually, what God had in mind for us when we got sent to the earth. What do we need to do to help make the beloved community possible? And I, I implore you to keep on being willing to step on that path and, and ask those kinds of questions. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Meeks. Before we go, a few words. As Dr. Meeks mentioned, uh, she will be speaking during the adult forum tomorrow at 10 o'clock. All of you are welcome to come and enjoy and uh, benefit from that conversation. Before you go, please stop by the book table where you can purchase uh, and peruse through uh, one of Dr. Meeks' most recent books, perhaps your most recent book. Um, and lastly, as you invite us to think about retelling that story, we have a particular opportunity ahead of us, and I'm going to ask Samantha to say a word or two about that. Thank you. I wanted to invite you to join our community in these sorts of conversations on an ongoing basis. Our Becoming Beloved Community Ministry meets on the first and third Wednesday of the month in the library. And we have been working on planning a particular opportunity for engaging the work at looking at the truth of our external reality um, this coming September to go to the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis and then to attend the dedication of the memorial for the Elaine Massacre. Um, and so we have some postcards with a little bit of information about that in the back of the room. And if you would like more information, um, I'll be standing back there also for questions. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Meeks. Thank you and good night.